Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to NOLACON, and uh, my, thank you for coming for my talk. I appreciate NOLACON for having me down here to speak. Um, let me jump right in. I want to start with giving a survey. I know it's first first talk, we're just getting started, but uh, I want some audience participation here because the intention of this talk is really to start a conversation. So when you hear the question, does DOD security work in the real world, how many people say yes? One, two, a few. How many people say no? Good, brave, a couple brave souls. I like discussion and lively debate. How many people just want to wait and hear what I have to say about it? And how many of us just want to be somewhere else right now? <laughs> All right. Um, the reason this question came about, uh, let me start with that. Uh, for about 10 years, I was uh, in the PCI world as a QSA. And uh, I had a customer probably, it's probably been almost a wait. Where should I not be? That's better. Okay, I am now limited to where I can pay, paste. Um, no, I think I should be up this way. Is that the other room? All right. Yep. I'm going to stand right here. Uh, I had a customer, probably been almost 10 years ago, we were having a discussion one afternoon about uh, encryption, the, the requirement in the PCI data security standard that says if you have data at rest, you need to protect it in some way. And uh, this was a major retailer. You've heard of them. You've probably shopped there. They actually were one of the companies that had been uh, a victim of a, a major breach back in the late 2000s. And, um, being a retailer and being only recently connected to the internet, relatively recently, they didn't have a whole lot of security expertise, as you might imagine. They didn't have a lot of institutional knowledge. So we spent the better part of an afternoon just kind of going through this requirement, and uh, I was kind of explaining to them what it all meant and, and you know what it meant to do encryption and all the other different options. And uh, at some point in the discussion, the person that I was speaking to said to me, yeah, but we don't need DOD level security because we just sell women's clothing, whatever it was. And that really has stuck with me for most of the last 10 years because it always kind of bothered me that this person just kind of casually cast off the, all this useful in, uh, institutional knowledge that I had about cryptography and encryption and just kind of dismissed it as, uh, yeah, but we don't need DOD level security. Anyway, my name is Jeff Mann. Uh, I'm a co-host on Security Weekly. If I look familiar to some of you, if any of you watch Security Weekly, uh, I uh, have done a few things in my life. I am considered a curmudgeon at this point. I've been doing this for about 35 years. Um, I got my start at NSA. Well, you're about to learn I didn't get my start at NSA, but the bulk of my DOD career was at NSA. While I was there, I was a cryptologist, which is why I had fun spending an afternoon talking about encryption. And uh, got out about 20 years ago, and I've been a consultant in the private sector ever since. Started out as a pen tester doing red teaming. Uh, moved into a few other things. Ended up doing PCI. I call it PCI purgatory for about 10 years. And uh, the last couple of years, uh, I was working for a software vendor. Uh, they brought me on as a subject matter expert, and they said, go out and start speaking at conferences. You know, you're an old guy, you know a lot. Go start teaching people and talking to people, which is largely why I'm here. Um, just a little, you know, 15 minutes of fame thing. Has anybody heard of this book? It came out last year called Dark Territory. If not, it's available on Amazon. You can look it up and download it now. Uh, in this book, in the fourth chapter, which is titled Eligible Receiver, does anybody know what Eligible Receiver is or was? You should go read the book and find out. But in that chapter titled Eligible Receiver, there's a, a paragraph that says, the NSA had a similar group called the Red Team. It was part of the Information Assurance Directorate, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it was the defensive side of NSA. It was stationed at Fanex. 
up near Friendship Airport, which uh, for modern day people was BWI. Um, during its most sensitive drills, the red team worked out of a chamber called the pit, which was so secret, I have to do this dramatically, that few people at NSA knew it even existed. And even they couldn't enter without first passing through two combination locked doors, not one, but two. Well, uh, I'm here to tell you I was actually a member of the pit, the original first red team at NSA, and the pit was our office. It did have a door, but we had cubicles and desks, and it was just a government office. But somehow we've morphed into this legendary thing called the pit. So for what it's worth, you have now can say you've met somebody from the pit. Um, this is actual uh, aerial footage outside of Friendship Airport, otherwise known as BWI, and that building right there, that corner, that's where our office was. So that's where the pit was. It, it, it was real. It did exist. It was an office with cubicles. I sat at a desk. Anyway, uh, I share that a little bit to give you a little bit of my background, but also I do want to say one of my early mentors uh, at NSA was this woman named Becky Bass. If you've never heard of her, I, I encourage you to look her up. Uh, she actually just passed away uh, back in March rather suddenly. Uh, her website, infidel.net, if you look that up, it's, it's sort of become a tribute site to her. There's, uh, people are putting up remembrances of her. Um, there's an actual uh, uh, a link, I think that's the link there, to an oral history that was done. Uh, somebody interviewed her. Uh, if you want to get a really good glimpse of InfoSec history, am I blocking you completely when I stand here? Sorry. Um, I'll try to give you glimpses every now and then. Um, really good history of InfoSec over the last 25, 30 years, uh, uh, a lot of involvement. She, she was a mentor to many um, out in the private sector, especially uh, bringing women uh, into InfoSec, into the technology community. Um, so. Uh, probably for the next year or so, or at least the rest of this year. My talks are dedicated to her. We called her mom or info mom. And uh, she's uh, one of the unsung, not, not, ne not necessarily well-known outside of the DC, Maryland area, heroes uh, of uh, info InfoSec. So this, is, this talk's for you, Becky. So my career really started back in 1984. Um, and it didn't start at NSA. I actually got a job as a summer intern at a research facility that at the time was called the Naval Surface Weapons Center. Uh, and this was in uh, White Oak, Maryland. So I, I, I'm from Maryland. And uh, my job was, for the summer, I was hired by this guy that was a physicist that did anti-submarine warfare research. And uh, he had gotten a hold of some money and was able to buy this kind of newfangled thing called a desktop computer. And uh, he bought some uh, early database software. I want to say it was DBase2, if any old timers out there remember DBase2. And my job was basically to go through this filing cabinet that he had uh, been collecting research material uh, probably over the span of about 25 years, most of his career that he had just piled into this safe, this locking cabinet, and he wanted me to build a, a, a relational database where he could start to capture some of the, you know, the details that are in all the different materials he had and uh, put it in a searchable database. So I got the, you know, it was sort of my first uh, uh, exposure to a personal computer, first exposure to database. Um, funny story, my first week on the job, he was trying to explain to me what anti-submarine warfare was. So he handed me this book and said, you know, this, this book just came out recently and it kind of explains what we do as well as I could, so read it. So I was this, you know, college student, summer intern working for the government and the first week I got to read a book. I thought that was really cool. So, uh, I don't know if you guys can see it, I might have to read it to you. So where this story starts is one morning, my first exposure to security really, is I walked in, I opened up this cabinet, and inside the drawer there was this pink slip that said, please come to the security office. So I went to the security office and it turns out that I had actually accidentally left the safe unlocked the night before and I was caught, I was busted. And uh, 
you know, I was a young college kid and I thought, well, what's the big deal? You know, we're, you know, this is the 80s. We're not at war. You know, we're not actively fighting any uh, submarine warfare anywhere. Um, and, you know, I I'm at this facility that's got a, a fence around it so nobody can just walk into the campus. There's, there's a control at the front desk where you have to go past turnstiles. You have to go through security to get into the building. I'm in an office that's locked, it's locked overnight, and there's guards that patrol the, the, the facility. So what's the big deal? You know, so I left the safe unlocked. Um, that was my attitude then, and uh, just keep that in the, the back of your mind. We'll, we'll bring that up again in a little while. So um, there's a little bit of background, a little bit of a preamble to what I want to try to convey today in terms of does DOD security work in the real world. And again, uh, I intend this to be a discussion starter. I'm, I'm not here trying to say I have the absolute and final opinion on all things related to InfoSec. Um, but if you're like me and you look at the, what's going on in the world today in terms of security, uh, is anybody depressed? Does it seem like we're losing? Um, I get depressed a lot. I'm not clinically depressed, but I get irritated that uh, I've got 35 years of experience and I try to teach people about security and we somehow as a community and as an industry uh, don't seem to be advancing things sometimes. We don't seem to be helping sometimes because time and time again companies are being confronted with uh, issues and breaches and problems. So um, what I wanted to do was, and still having this, well, we don't need DOD level security in the back of my mind from this person that told me this eight or nine years ago, I wanted to put together some thoughts and share it with you guys again as a discussion starter. Um, my first thought is, in my experience, when I start talking to people about DOD level security, I think a lot of people have the opinion, especially if you haven't worked for the DOD, that it's some ultra high, super secret, super secure, lots of technology, lots of cost and expense. It's this nth degree of security. Um, I also like to throw in movie uh, slides uh, to my talks. Does anybody know what that movie is from? Very good. Um, in my experience, uh, when I was with the DOD, there were many facets to security. There were many different sub-disciplines, if you will, to security. And I've just tried to capture a few, and I tried to add a few. I Googled. I saw what new ones are out there. So I don't even know if I could tell you what all of those things are. But, uh, and, and the government likes to abbreviate, abbreviate everything with one syllable or two syllable words. So. ComSec is communication security. That's what it was called when I started at NSA. It later became information security or InfoSec. Um, OpSec is operational security. Uh, MSec is emission security. You get the idea. Uh, sig sig signals intelligence, satellite intelligence, communications intelligence, and on and on and on and on. A lot of different disciplines, a lot of different things go into DOD security. But the way I was taught, the way I was classically trained, uh, was we learned this risk equation. And, you know, this is not new. I'm sure most of you have, are, have, have at least heard of the risk equation, if not, you know, have worked with it or somewhat familiar with it. And you can see some of the words in it. This certainly is what drives our security industry. We're all about vulnerabilities. We're a little bit about threats. We're talking about risks all the time. But, uh, the basic risk equation is you have this concept of if you're an organization, if you're an entity, if you're a country, if you're the DOD, the military, you're, you have something that is at risk. There is some sort of risk to you. And that risk can be measured, and there's a thousand different algorithms and calculations you can do. None of them are perfect, so I just try to simplify it. But uh, risk is some sort of combination of the vulnerabilities that are present within your environment, the threats the, the, that are uh, coming against your organization, and this is and this combination is hopefully reduced by whatever you do in terms of security, what we used to call countermeasures. So, you know, very simplistic algorithm, very sim simplistic equation, but the idea is you're trying to reduce risk, lower risk. 
And you have three options. You either reduce vulnerabilities, you reduce the threat, or you apply more countermeasures. Makes sense, right? As I was putting this together, it occurred to me the risk equation as it applies to the DOD, risk is most often uh, in reference to human life whether it's uh, a branch of the military and you're trying to determine what the risk of deploying forces are, if, you know, in terms of national security, it might be a risk to citizens, it might be a risk to, you know, diplomats and, and citizens that are deployed abroad. But essentially, and it's pro I'm probably overgeneralizing a little bit, but essentially risk in the sense of the DOD, in the sense of national security, in the sense of the defense of our country, can be thought of mostly in terms of human life. And because of that, uh, the approach that I learned to security in the DOD was not, not so much at all, you know, no costs, uh, um, you know, there was no limitation to budget, but it was sort of like that. You know, it didn't matter what the cost was associated with it. It didn't matter what the budgets were. We had to do security a certain way. We had to do security right. We had to do a security to a certain degree and all those elements that I showed you and more were involved in it. Um, the way I was taught the equation, vulnerabilities, I ask, I go to conferences and trade shows all the time and especially when I see vendors splashing the big screens, uh, the banners saying they do vulnerability or they do threat, I'll go up and ask them, what is a vulnerability? Uh, try it yourself sometimes, see what kind of different answers you get or even better, what's a threat? Um, I was trained that vulnerability is a weakness, period. Leave it at that. Don't get into details. It's a weakness. Threat, the way I was trained, is the who that is trying to do something bad to you. Um, but you go out and ask people, and maybe even some of you have uh, you know similar ideas, but threat, I think, is most often described in our industry as more of what I used to... Uh, or I was taught was a threat agent. It's what the threat, the who is doing to you or how they're doing it. It's the thing that's happening. Which, I'm not trying to be picky uni, I'm not trying to nitpick, but again, the way I was classically trained, the threats are the who, it's not the what or the how. And, and then finally, the countermeasures are all the things that you do to try to protect yourself, whether that's driving down vulnerabilities or driving down threats or other active corrective actions, you know, whether it's monitoring, whether it's logging, whether it's, you know, increased perimeter security. And again, this not, not even necessarily in the context of networks, but even in the context of physical security, applying more guards, building a, a bigger wall, build, building a bigger fence, putting concertina wire on the top of the fence, and so on and so forth. These are all the things that are done to protect against the threat and hopefully reduce, not necessarily who's doing it to you, but their ability to do something to you. And hopefully this is familiar to you as well. Uh, security often had to do with data security, communications, in the specific instance of NSA. And we were classically trained that the way you, you know, what could go wrong, what you're trying to do with protecting data boils down to three different things, confidentiality, inte integrity, and availability. So, you know, those should all be familiar concepts. These are not new things. The, the internet and technology computer world has is, is introduced a few more nuances to these three, but these are still the three basic things. Most of what we do in this industry drives back to one of these three things, with a few exceptions. Um, my first office at NSA, I was in the, I was on the defensive side and I was in the office, I was in the office that produced one-time pads. Um, yes, we were using them in the 80s. In fact, I think we're still using them somewhere today, but I, you know, don't quote me because I haven't worked for the government in many years. But, uh, if you're not familiar with the one-time pad, the one-time pad is perfect encryption. So long as it's used properly, which is one time, it is not cryptographically solvable. Most of the other cryptography that is involved these days, especially in our machine computer networking world, are machine generated, are computationally formulated, are algorithmically based, which means that although the numbers might be large, there is a cryptographic solution. It can be broken, it can be solved given enough time. Not so with the one-time pad. So 
My simplistic attitude, having started in that office, is it's all been downhill ever since we decided not to use a one-time pad. Perfect encryption, perfect security, we've given that up for speed and convenience and the ability to stream video and stuff like that. So it's been downhill from there. So again, getting back to this concept, we don't need DOD level security. Um, some of the reasons that I've seen why DOD level security doesn't seem to be sticking, doesn't, there doesn't seem to be much interest in it, are some of these ideas. And I think most importantly is it, it, it may very well be very expensive. It may just be simply a perception that it's more expensive. Um, but certainly there is a monetary cost to doing more than, than, than what you're doing uh, in, in the near term. Um, there's a lot of companies out there, a lot of organizations that I've worked with over the years that just simply didn't think they needed it. You know, we sell shoes, we sell underwears. Uh, when Home Depot was hacked a couple years ago, the CEO was literally on record as saying, we don't care about security, we sell hammers. Yeah. So it's real. There's a lot of attitudes out there. It's like, ah, oh, why do we need to bother with all this security? Um, a lot of these companies, until they got on the internet, they really didn't have to worry about security in the sense of networking security, internet security, all this stuff that we're doing these days. Um, and that's legitimate to some point. They didn't need to. But they're, they're in a connected world, and I've always argued with my customers that, you know, there's a price to all that uh, convenience that you're getting, especially in the credit card world. Um, how many people are old enough to remember using a credit card back in the days when uh, the, the clerk th that was accepting your card would pull out a, a, a little brochure or magazine and flip through it to look up and see if your card was listed. Does anybody remember that? You're old, you're old, you're old. More recently, it would be you submit your credit card, they'd ring out the cash register, they'd turn around, pick up the telephone, dial an 800 number, and wait for an operator and they would read off the, the transaction information, you know, the amount, the credit card number, they'd wait for the authorization. Anybody remember that? Yeah. How long did that typically take? Three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes? Whereas nowadays you walk up, well, chip, chip and signature notwithstanding, because that thing's a bear, but you know, swipe your card, a few seconds later you've got the authorization and you're out. So now we've regressed in using the chips, which I don't understand, but that's another story for another day. The point I've tried to make to these companies over the years is, you know, how many, how many people are you moving through the line? How more quickly, how many more transactions, how much more revenue are you earning? Um, because you're not doing that, you know, three to five to eight to ten minute process. You're, you've turned it into a 15 second, 30 second process. They get that. They understand the dollars and cents. And then I say, okay, well, that comes at a cost. And one of the costs is you need to do security. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The point is they don't have it as a background. So part of sort of winning this, this, this thing that we're in of trying to make companies more secure is trying to help them understand the, the impact of security. The, there's a need to do security. And it generally boils down to, especially in the commercial world, a financial discussion. Um, if you haven't guessed already, you know, my response to does DO, you know, oh, I, we really don't need DOD level security. And I'm like, yeah, you really do. I even updated it it's up to the minute. Um, and I'm not even sure what to tell people that are dealing with malware, but, um, Hopefully we can discuss that. But, um, and in fact, <laughs> I may know what the wireless password is for this hotel. It's up there on the screen. I was like, oh, I'm at that hotel. Remind me not to use my credit card here anywhere, especially down at the bar. Uh, cash only. Anyway, lots of companies continue to be get, getting breached. Companies that you wouldn't expect, you know, government, private sector, whatever, even security companies. Um, it just seems to be going on and on and on. Target was interesting because um, in the PCI world, uh, the last PCI organization I was working for, we were actually negotiating to be the assessors for Target. And they actually had a really good reputation for 
having a, a security staff, a rather large security staff. They had invested in the technology. They were doing all the right things. They were taking security and the standards seriously. And they got popped in an egregious way. And it turns out that they were missing a few things. And, and I think some of the things that they were missing goes back to the point that I'm hoping to make is there's something missing when you don't sort of have this mindset, this attitude about security. So let's move on. Um, why I think networks are insecure, why I think organizations continue to lose, to continue to be breached, is because essentially uh, too often, especially in the commercial world, companies want to fast forward to the bottom line. Just tell me what do I have to buy, where do I need to put it, how much is it going to cost, and then they make their decision. They kind of skip over the classical things that I and others that, that have come from the military, uh, the DOD, have tried to teach over the years. And to some degree, our, our uh, industry has tried to teach is that, you know, you need to put processes in place. You need to have some sort of policy or program. You need to have some organization and sense of what you're trying to accomplish. And they're like, yeah, 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 that's boring. Tell me what I need to buy and tell me where I need to put it. So. Uh, lots of different reasons, uh, but they, they boil up, I think, to a couple different categories. And if we're honest with ourselves in our industry, I don't think we've helped a whole lot. And I'm not saying us individually, but, uh, you know, it's a whole lot easier if you're in sales and marketing for a, a, a security vendor to just, uh, you know, write up the sale. How many do you need? I think you need six. This is how much, you know, it'll cost. You know, how many can I put you down for? rather than walk through that complicated discussion. Or I was a consultant for many years. It's a whole lot easier to buy a product than it is to buy a consulting engagement where you end up with a written report where, in theory, some of the people that are your customer already knew what you were going to tell them. In fact, very often as a, as a consultant, I would go in and say to certain people, even in, in, even in the PCI times, what are you telling your management? that they're not hearing because especially with PCI, I said, I've got this cool cape that I wear, it says PCI, and your management will listen because if it gets labeled PCI, they're gonna do it. They're gonna write the check just to make it go away. That was one of the ways I was able to win win friends with IT and and, and information security people. But um, but it's not about the customers, it's about us. Um, again using PCI as an example. Uh, Roughly 99% of the companies in the world that have to do PCI don't talk to a QSA, and yet the whole PC PCI ecosystem is hinged on the security expert being the QSA, and if you have a question, ask your QSA. If you're not sure of something, if you need an interpretation, if you need a risk-based conclusion drawn, ask your QSA. That's great if you're engaged with a QSA, but literally 99% of the companies out there don't talk to a QSA. Who are they left to talk to? Vendors. Vendors, in case you haven't figured it out yet, lie. Um, vendors, and I used to say that all the time, and I've learned having worked for a vendor, that it's, they're not always shamelessly lying. Sometimes they're just ignorant and unaware, and they don't know anything more than the customer. So they're just spouting off the buzzwords and the marketing pitches and the buyer personas and the use cases. Um, there's this collective lack of understanding and knowledge in what, why are we doing this? What's this all about? And that's, I guess, what I'm trying to hammer home more than anything. So, just a few lessons of what I think we can do in terms of looking at DOD level security. There's probably more, and again, feel free to disagree with me, but these are some areas that I've thought about that I think we've sort of skipped or omitted or not emphasized enough as we try to do this thing we call InfoSec uh, in today's world. Movie? Very good. Um, and there's the proof. Um, they're actually sitting on a Cray supercomputer, which uh, the one I used to use at NSA is now in the NSA Cryptologic Museum. So that's ancient technology, but it used to rock because it was so fast. But anyway, um, the point of the movie Sneakers, the, the point of this conversation that the uh, protagonists and the antagonists are having is that the, the world is at war, I'm paraphrasing, 
Um, and the war is not being fought with bullets, it's being fought with data. It's all about the information. And I think that's true uh, today as it's been for, for decades. Uh, the battles that we're fighting, the, the war that we're fighting, it's all about the information. And yet too often, especially in the commercial world, we're not focused on the very thing that we're trying to protect. We focus on the technology that we think is being used to house, store, transmit the data that we're trying to protect. And that's nuanced, and it might be nitpicky, but I think it's a significant gap when the focus is so often on the technology and not on what's on the technology that we might be interested in. So disagree or agree with me, but that is, that's, that's what I'm putting forth to you guys. So in terms of the risk equation, when I think of the risk equation in the commercial world, what immediately gets added to this equation is money. Risk, as I said, in the DOD, in terms of national security, can be expressed in, in human life. But risk in the, in the real world is really dollars and cents. It really boils down to money. Um, how much money are you standing to lose? How much money do you, uh, you know, are you comfortable with being fined? Uh, what are the liabilities if you do or don't do certain things? And then, of course, to, to try to reduce your vulnerabilities costs money. To try to do something about your threats costs money. All the countermeasures that we do counts money. But because it's all about data, um, what I'm proposing is uh, you need to understand the value of the data that you're trying to protect. Um, in the DOD, in the military, in the government, there's this concept of data classification. Not a new concept. A lot of companies understand this, and they know that they have to do it because of whatever regulatory standard. Um, but in the DOD, there is a big difference between secret, top secret, confidential. These are these were very distinct classifications that. Uh, had very distinct differences in terms of data handling, data storage, data retention um, that aren't, in my experience, matched in the commercial world. More often than not, when I've been out at a customer site and they are required to do data classification, it's sort of binary. It's uh, company confidential or unclassified, we don't care about it. And so they, ha they can have lots of different types of data that they care about, but they just kind of lump it into one category. In the government, uh, the best way that I can give you an analogy, and I'm just going to talk about it because I don't have a picture, um, is uh, in, in the way that I, it was explained to me, and especially in terms of sort of the life expectancy, the value of data in terms of how long it's, it's valuable data, was top secret information that has to be protected forever most often, what is secret about this, and, and gosh, this might have been in the news in the last couple days or weeks, so think about this as you, uh, as you listen to media reports. Top secret information very often is classified at that level, not because of the data itself, but because of how that data was obtained, what we call methods and sources. It's who knows that data, how many people in the world know that data, and, and or how was that data conveyed, in what circumstance. You know, sometimes it might be a conversation between two or three people inside a, a, a conference room in a certain building in a certain nation state that isn't ours. And if it was revealed that that information was known by us, you would make the logical conclusion of one or two things. Either the room was bugged or somebody in that room is, is, is an agent, is, is a spy. So uh, in the old days, very often if that information was discovered uh, and they didn't find bugs, uh, people ended up missing. So again, it was a human life thing. So the top secret concept is, uh, again, more often the methods and sources, how the information was obtained. Now, another example might be secret information. Again, the analogy that I was given when I was learning this was, uh, think of a battlefield, and, and you've got a, a unit that's being pinned down by enemy gunfire, there's a machine gun nest, there's mortar fire, and so they want to call in an airstrike. It's critical when they're calling in that airstrike 
to give the right coordinates. And back in those days, it was latitude and longitude. Nowadays, I'm sure they use GPS, and you know, we got the drones and everything. But you know, think Korea, think Vietnam, think you know, uh, early early things in the desert. Um, you call in an airstrike, it's really, really important that you get the coordinates right so the bombs are dropping on the bad guy or the drone's hitting the bad guy. Um, but 30 minutes later, once the airstrike has come in, the fact that you were sending out those coordinates, it's not really that important. So the life expectancy is very short, and that drives down the classification. Um, my point of all that is we don't really, in the commercial world, spend a whole lot of time distinguishing data and figuring out what the value is, what the value is in terms of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, we tend to just blanket everything. We've got to protect the whole network, but we've got to protect everything at the same degree, at the, you know, to whatever degree we think is appropriate. We've got to eliminate all the vulnerabilities. Without understanding that this server over here, and of course it's now in the cloud, um, has vital uh, research and development data that's uh, under government contract and it's, and it's vital to national security interests versus payroll for our, for our employees versus customer information that we're collecting. Different types of data, different types of uh, sensitivities, criticalities, different types of values, and yet we don't in the commercial world seem to, co seem to divide and conquer and, and understand what it is we're protecting. We just do this blanket, the network needs to be secure, and it's not, it's bad, gloom and doom. Um, another concept is what used to be called security in depth. We would call it uh, more likely segmentation or isolation in today's networking world. But this is a, an aerial photograph of a city that was constructed in the 1500s. You know, so the idea of layered protection is not new. This goes back 500 years. But I mean, if you think about when were the first castles with moats built, the idea of you know layers of protection is thousands of years old. And it's really a military construct. It's a military strategy for warfare that we've applied to the network. Is that good or bad? I don't know. But um, this is a typical network, at least a couple years ago, for one of my PCI customers that were trying to go through the idea of segmentation because they knew if they could isolate the systems that had the credit card data, they'd only have to follow the security rules for those systems and not worry about everything else which I personally think is a bad idea. But, uh, uh, you know, so this was the typical, you know, back-end data center, operations, office environment, a couple versions of their retail locations. And the red circles were the, the systems that were uh, deemed to be uh, housing or storing or processing credit card information. That doesn't look a whole lot like that to me. And that, these days, are, are now, uh, a lot of those environments are virtualized, a lot of those environments are cloud-based, a lot of the infrastructure is going to the cloud. So this whole idea of layered protection, I think is, uh, it may be gone. It's certainly hard to figure it out. But uh, I do agree that there's this idea of adding layers of security to your most sensitive data. Um, the way we were taught was uh, for the security of some systems or, or some data, um, it wasn't so much add the layers of protection so a bad guy could never get to it. It was make it more trouble than it's worth. You know, make it more expensive for the bad guy, and, and for us the bad guy was other nation states, to, to, to bother with trying to get at this particular set of data, this particular set of information. We actually used to evaluate systems because I worked on the defensive side. We would evaluate the security of systems based on the projected cost of what it would take to break the system because it's machine made so it's computationally feasible. We would calculate the cost and compare that to the what used to be the GNP, which is now usually the GDP, which is how you measure the economic uh, wealth of a country, which is, again is another discussion, it used to be GNP. Um, we would calculate it as against a certain nation state's GNP and say, are they going to spend that money, much money to try to get to this data, yes or no? If the answer was no, we were done, move on. It wasn't necessarily perfect security. It was more expensive than what it was worth. And that was sometimes applying layers of security. 
The biggest thing, though, is the upon reflection back to my beginning days uh, of being involved in the government was, as I looked back, I realized when I went to work for this, this uh, research facility um, back in the 80s that there was this culture of security. Um, and while there was perimeter fences, there was also other processes and things associated with the perimeter fences. You know, like barbed wire, like cameras, like a roving guard. Um, the the front desk, uh, it seemed kind of silly at times, but at various times over the years, uh, if there was a guard at the desk, they were supposed to be looking at your picture badge. And, you know, we would, you know, at various facilities I worked for, we would occasionally try to get by with each other's badge to see if the guard was paying attention. Um, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, and more often it worked. So at various times, you know, of heightened security, DEF CON 3 or 4 or 5, uh, the guards were required to touch the badge to make sure that they were really touching it in hopes that they were looking at it more carefully. But then the, the guards would get the, I think they would rip them off of radios, these telescoping antenna things, wands, pointers, so they could reach out and touch the badge because they didn't want to move from their spot. But there was also strategies employed where the guards were rotated all the time because they wanted to prevent Somebody saying, hey, Joe, come on in. I've seen you every day for the last, you know, 16 years. Come on in, not knowing you'd been fired the day before. There were layers, there were strategies, there was processes with each step along the way. You know, changing the locks on the doors periodically, making it a longer combination, that type of thing. Having the guards roaming the halls. Everything was a culture of security, but more important than all the processes and procedures, everybody understood the mission, because the mission of the organization in and of itself was security, which I grant you doesn't exist often in the commercial world. But I think, and I'm hopeful that it's something that can be taught and something that can be trained to more companies, is to have this attitude, this mindset of, you know, we're in business, yes, we sell women's clothing, but we're selling women's clothing in a connected world, and we, we deal in certain type of information between our company and our customers that has value, and we need to understand that value and understand it needs to be protected and protected in a, in a manner that's uh, appropriate for whatever risk we want to take, given the liabilities, given the limitations, given our, you know, our bottom line, our budgets, and so forth. But you know, more than just uh, you know, taking the 30-minute security awareness training course once a year and snickering at the stupid video that you watch because somebody you know, went out and bought some new, and if anybody produces these things, I apologize, but I've had to, I've had to evaluate a lot of these security awareness training courses over the year, and, and I take them as often as possible, and, um, you know, they just seem to be people that are like, you know, they're, they're very much focused on the creativity. This time we're going to do a video. This time we're going to do pictures that pop up. This time we're going to slide from the right and fly from the left, rather than providing any type of meaningful content. Yes? No. Actually, we'll get to that. Um, we'll get to that. Hold that thought. Um, building a culture of security, having everybody in the company understand that security is important and what they do and what they don't do has something to do with security. Understanding that security is, is a life cycle. It's something that you do. Um, it's not just a, a set and forget. It's not plug in a box and put particular settings on it and walk away and think you're done. Um, this is a slide that I used 20 years ago when I came out of the DOD trying to teach companies in the commercial world that there's this thing called security and it's a life cycle and there's processes involved. And we used to talk about these processes. And of course, we were trying to sell a pen test, so we started with the assessing. You know, where are you? You've just plugged into the Internet, but you have this existing network. Let's find all your holes. Let's figure out. It was really a vulnerability assessment. And we would talk about once we've discovered it, how do you fix it? How do you close your holes? How do you implement programs and policies and procedures so it all works? And you architect and implement these solutions. You put in firewalls and IDS and whatever. And then at some point, you've got to measure it and see how well you're doing. And then it's, it's you know, lather, rinse, and repeat. We used to talk about this cycle in terms of like a three to five year process. This process still exists. Every company is in the midst of this process, but the process these days, I, I think, is sometimes months, if not weeks, if not days, you know, 
Think of the, the next O day that comes out and, and how fast you need to be able to respond to it and adapt to it. But companies, for the most part, in the commercial world aren't cycled to think security. They're cycled to think money, revenue, bottom line. It's not part of the culture. It's not built into the fabric of the company. Um, you know, th there's been attempts by the government to put out, uh, you know, frameworks and various standards, the NIST cybersecurity framework being one of the recent ones. Notice that there's, at least I see, there's a lot of similarities between what they're putting out in terms of sort of the major steps, the major processes, and what we were talking about 20, 25 years ago. Variations on a theme, but there's a process involved, and that's what is, is largely trying to be taught. Um, you need to know where you are, you need to have policies and strategies, you need to have this culture of security built into companies. And we as practitioners, if not for our own company, if we're in a, in a role where we talk to other companies as customers, we need to teach this, we need to, we need to hammer this home, we need to build this in, because I think this is more than any technical solution, any strategy, any, any new box or widget or blinky thing that you put out there is what's really going to make a difference ultimately. And I'm a dying breed, and you can disagree with me, but that, that's sort of my last, my last stance. Um, the DOD, uh, anybody know what this is? It's called the Rainbow Series. Uh, a very compre comprehensive series of uh, guides that were put out. The first one was the Orange Book which I think was published in 83, which was how to, com how to secure a computer on a network. And uh, very detailed, very granular, every aspect, every thing you could possibly think of. Everybody that used to have to deal with it laughed because it was very comprehensive, but everybody conceded nobody's ever going to be able to do this because there's just too much here. And that's when it was just four or five of them. I don't even know what all of those are, but as new technologies emerged, Another guide was produced. So the DOD gave us that, but, uh, and I apologize you can't see this. I saw this on uh, LinkedIn probably two months ago. Somebody mapped it out. You can find it if you Google CISO mind map. These are all the disciplines, sort of the major areas and all the detailed things that a CISO is supposed to know in order to be able to do his job in today's modern organization. And I would submit to you that all that fine print that you can't really read but if you Google it later, you'll be able to find the details. Probably 95% of those are tied to a specific technology product, which again, I think is, is, is missing the point when all you do is know how to throw different technology at this problem. Um, this is another example that I saw. Somebody attempted to, to come up with all the different domains that there are in, the, in, our, in our business, and they try to group them and organize them. So, uh, you know, the message here is there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to know. There's a lot of stuff going on. And yet, if you, my belief is if you're taking a completely technology-centric approach to all this and you're not stepping into it with some sort of overarching understanding of what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish, you ultimately will lose. Because I think we can agree we're never going to protect everything. I think we can agree we're never going to drive the vulnerability count down to zero. There's always going to be vulnerabilities out there. So maybe, just maybe, we should stop focusing on the vulnerabilities. Not saying do away with them, not saying stop addressing them as we find them out, but maybe we need to focus elsewhere too, like on the countermeasures. Um, you've probably heard of this mantra in our industry that security is really about people, processes, and technology. It's a three-pronged approach. I submit to you that in terms of understanding the culture that there's this idea of purpose. You know, for the DOD it was the mission to do security. And while that's not the mission of most companies in the commercial world, it needs to be a part of the mission. It needs to be understood that the security is part of we sell shoes. It's security is a part of we sell hammers. An appropriate part. Not overboard, not overdone, but there is an appropriate way to approach that. So keep in mind, it's all about the information, it's all about the data. With few exceptions, that's still true today. It always will be. Um, technology, I don't believe, is the solution. I think technology is really the problem. I think we're losing ground, frankly, the way technology has advanced. And the more we don't have the foundational principles and processes built in, the, the further behind we get 
whether we're organizations or whether we're practitioners. Um, remember, security is not some place that you get to. It, it's a lifestyle. I, I say it's a verb. It's something you do. And uh, I think you can hold me to it, but I didn't say that word once, did I, in this presentation? <laughs> Knowledge and awareness is, is key. So to answer your question, um, just a quick word about the company that's sponsoring me. Uh, a company called Cybrary, they've been around for about a year and a half now. They're dedicated to providing open source uh, learning and training in, in the area of information security. You can sign up for free. You can take hours and hours of free training. Um, there's lots of pre-certification things you can do. Um, they have things that you do pay for, like various labs and detailed stuff. But I, I think for at a personal level, it's like maybe $9 a month. You know, so something something around $100 a year, you can get lots and lots of training. Um, they have, uh, they just celebrated uh, last week hitting the million subscriber mark. So they've got a million people that are signed up taking free training. Um, you know, going all the way back to the beginning, uh, you know, when I said this talk was dedicated to my mentor, Becky Bass, those of us that are curmudgeons, we've sort of agreed uh, that, uh, you know, trying to backfill the void that uh, is left with the passing of Becky Bass is very difficult, but all of us need to do our part. So, you know, we that are sort of the old timers and the, you know, the gatekeepers of all this institutional knowledge, um, we're committed to sharing that knowledge with the community as, as, as much as possible. It's one of the reasons why I come out and speak. Um, I've got a head full of sometimes my wife thinks useless knowledge. But I want to share it with you because security is this, this huge nebulous thing that needs to be understood beyond all the fun technology things that we do and all the fun hacking things we do. Um, and I'm convinced more than anything at the end of the week, at the end of the day, at the end of our existence, knowledge is the only way that we're ever going to really advance this thing forward. So to answer your question, have I seen great training, good training? Mm, look there. You might find something that's pretty decent. Um, in fact, I've got a course up there that was put up there. I, I teach a course uh, at Cyberay on effective communication skills because uh, I've heard a lot of people at these cons over the years talking about knowing all the answers, and I keep thinking, if you know the answer and you're working for a company that's got an issue uh, and you're not getting the point across to them, maybe you're the problem, and maybe the problem is you're not communicating it well. So. I took my 20 years of consulting knowledge and wrapped it into a course that's hopefully a little bit humorous. I got to wear my Jedi Master costume for the whole thing. They thought it was cool. I didn't think I'd get away with it, but they let me do it. So uh, if nothing else, go check out my course. I have no idea what we're doing on time, but is there time for questions or comments as I see people walking in? Comments, questions, pushback. Yes? Yes? I can try. You want the first one or the second one? Good. Oops. There you go. Great question. Um, a layer that I didn't add for simplicity's sake. Um, but yeah, I basically when I was taught risk equations in the DOD, it was uh, there was two, always two versions considered. One was the likelihood that something was going to be attacked, so the likelihood of, of, of compromise, and the second was the likelihood of success. If somebody were to try to, you know, do something to this, what would, what, what's the likelihood that they would succeed? So, you know, when we were trying to map this out, and, I, you know, I could, I could geek out and probably do it, maybe I will do a talk on the risk equation someday, but we, we kind of mapped it out in a four square which I kind of refuse to do because there's a certain company that I don't like that misuses four squares. We won't get into that. Um, but yeah, it, 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 risk, risk can be very complicated and it's very nebulous, but when you're talking to C-level uh, people at an organization and you start talking dollars and cents, that's usually when they can start paying attention. So I just, you know, one of my Jedi mind tricks is to just simplify, you know, break it down because a lot of people get caught up in the minutiae and details, and most people don't understand, don't care, just what's the bottom line. Any other questions or comments? Yes? Mm -hmm. 
So the question for the recording is, you know, there's something in the news this week with NATO talking about anti-submarine warfare, that that's back in the news again. Um, submarines carry nukes. So that's, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with, you know, the details, but my guess is it's because sub submarines carry nukes that they're in the news again. Uh, with the people in the room, I'm thinking my time is up. So thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy your conference. It was long and possible. And I've got stickers if you want them. I've got some Cyberry stickers and some Security Weekly Hack Naked stickers up here.